we have a public comment section of the evening. If there's anyone here who's not leaving right now, uh, who's left standing or sitting, who has anything to say other than what we're about to talk about, um, feel free to raise your hand. We will start, all right? Oh yeah, I guess we have some, some newbies here tonight, so we can uh, go around the table. Some, I think everyone, I think, has been introduced, but why don't we go around, Carolyn, start with you, and just go around the table and introduce everybody. Um, Carolyn Nish, we ask the Finance State Sustainability. Ann Brooks. John Lutz. Dan Felton. Mark Sullivan. Devin Bruce. Carla Youngblood. Alan Versum. Bill Grinnell. So welcome you guys. Thank you. And let's begin. What do you got, Carolyn? So um, the first item is, and I'll put it on the screen here, but you guys have looked at this language a couple of times now since we started, when we came back to it after um, it went through council. Um, and the last time we looked at the language, um, sorry, I'm just bring it up in here. Um, there was one aspect of it that you uh, you all were uncomfortable with, and that was the the pick list essentially. Sorry, I'm on the wrong thing. Um, um, the pick list for options for the special permit included um, mechanisms to um, uh, achieve some of the goals in the plan that included lead certification and um, affordable housing, small footprint housing. And uh, you guys wanted us to work with the building department to come up with some other, some other um, choice other than using lead as a standard. So, um, basically, we, we, so we went back and looked at that and then brought the whole business back hoping that um, we'll wrap it up in this session and we can send it on to council so that we could have, be ready for an April hearing with the goal that this whole language that we're about to talk about will replace the moratorium that would otherwise expire in July for the construction of more than seven units in the urban residential B and C districts. <coughs> So um, I'll just start um, at the at the top here um, with the language of and this ordinance that I sent you. You guys had a copy of um, and you've seen before is is just for the URB, but the same language would apply in URC except that it applies to multifamily and townhouse. Where in URB we only allow single, two, and three family units, and then other units are only allowed at, at townhouse project by special permit so that's why it specifies down on the second page with just special permit but the same language will just carry over for the URC district it'll have to come in as a separate ordinance in the package um, so we talked about let's see we have really good technology here um, we talked about uh, adding the um, requirement for site plan approval if you're creating a new separate detached structure on a lot that already has a structure on it. So that's what that first item is. Um, and if you remember, the B and C districts have in the table, there's a list of all the uses by right, followed by uses by site plan, and then uses by special permit. The reason why what you're seeing here are just additions to site plan and special permit is because those are the only pieces of the ordinance that was adopted in September that are proposed to be modified. Um, and then, of course, in the special permit section um, that we went to have gone over a couple times now is this um, first item. The first strikeout is just um, this bullet here upon completion of the nine-month moratorium. So um, this would be deleted from the current ordinance and then the following bulleted points would then be substituted in to replace the moratorium. So the design standards that you guys have talked about to address the concern of the creation of more than um, more than seven and ten units, um, there were two different thresholds. So the idea was to just have one threshold to simplify it. So instead of having a, a design threshold that would just hold for ten units. This design threshold would carry over for any any construction of seven or more units. 
So the first row of buildings along a street shall face the street and add to the streetscape to the extent possible. There shall not be any parking except incidental to a driveway or roadway between the first row of buildings and the street. So we really want those buildings up at the street and the parking behind um, so that that um, neighborhood streetscape can be maintained. Um, all projects, uh, I'm sorry, driveways and roadways that provide access to buildings must be pedestrian focused and um, not dominated by parking. Here. Um, number two, all projects uh, shall ensure that connectivity to the street is attained, including making streetscape, um, making streetscape between the property and the road pedestrian friendly and in conformance with the city best city's best practices. Such streetscapes include rebuilding as necessary the granite curbs, ADA compliant concrete sidewalks, tree belts, and when possible, rain gardens and appropriate drainage improvements. So this is the area in the right of way in front of these <coughs> potential structures that might need some upgrades <coughs> to bring them up to current code if they are um, in a deteriorated state. Um, then going on to page two, um, um, projects shall connect to all surrounding neighborhoods um, with year-round uh, bicycle and pedestrian access to the extent possible. That's to um, create, make sure that these neighborhoods are built in isolation, that you have some connectivity. Are you doing it in the And um, year round, so that uh, any party that's responsible needs to clear the snow so that it's not you know, only available um, in the spring, summer, and fall. Driveways and roadways shall internally and externally connect and avoid dead ends whenever possible. Dead end roadways and driveways shall never exceed 500 feet, which is the same standard we have for subdivision. Um, and those must include bicycle and pedestrian connection from the dead end street to a park or civic space. Um, driveways and roadways shall either have separate sidewalks or be designed as shared streets focused on pedestrians and bicyclists and engineered to keep speeds below 15 miles per hour. All projects shall include a park or civic space that serves as a focal point of the project. It's easily accessible, available, and desirable for residents of the project. Um, and buildings that abut existing residential property shall incorporate building articulation and well-designed side facades. Building projections shall be incorporated for any side facade that is longer than 30 feet. Front facades shall have similar setbacks as other buildings in the area or provide a different setback uh, that is consistent with the location, either closer setbacks in rural urban areas or different setbacks because of the natural resource constraints. Um, and six and seven were already in the ordinance, and then eight um, buildings shall meet either, and this is a section that you all wanted us to um, work on, <clears throat> shall meet a home energy rating system uh, rating of 45, or the U.S. Green Building Council lead new construction and new development goal certified or contain 15% of the units meeting the zoning definition of affordability, or contain 50% or more of the units in a large square <coughs> floor area for at least five years on issuance of certificate of occupancy, or any combination of the items A through D if approved by the board. Um, special permits filed under this provision may be submitted for review and approval prior to and separately from fully engineered site plans so long as the following items are identified in any preliminary site plan with a special permit and full detailed engineered site plans are filed for review and approval prior to commencement of construction. So we will need in those site plans roadway or driveway alignments showing compliance with the connectivity standards, buffers, and preliminary landscaping abutting existing neighborhoods, proposed location of parks and open space, building envelopes and location, anticipated building types and the total number of units, and then a statement that 
In any special permit um, approval granted with only preliminary site plan, the board may establish thresholds in which the amendment of that special permit is required either prior to or in parallel with review of fully engineered plan. So again, <clears throat> a lot of these design <clears throat> um, concepts came from concerns from the neighborhood and then we had this follow-up with Lyman Estate um, sort of focused meeting um, where additional concerns about, certainly about energy efficiency and affordable housing and sort of um, trying to target smaller house options for people came up, which is why those got included in this um, pick list. And we did keep one of the, um, I'm going to go back and talk about the energy piece a bit. Um, the HERS rating of 45, um, the building commissioner and I talked back and forth um, extensively about that and what number to, you know, um, um, to select based on the fact that the stretch code is changing and currently um, the stretch code uh, requires a HERS of 50, I think, or is it 60? Seven. No, it's 60. Seven. Uh, I think it's 60, <coughs> actually. Okay. So um, <coughs> going to 45 would represent you know, 20% improvement over that, but then we don't exactly know where the stretch code is going, um, but that looking at all the projects that have come forward, um, it would be pretty hard for everyone to hit 45. Uh, I mean, it's, a, it, it's not hard as an impossible, but you would really be pushing the developer to get to 45, and based on current construction. So we've got some developers that are going well below that. Um, but, um, and those are the ones that are work, working really hard to sort of market themselves as being um, green, you know, going after that green <coughs> market niche. And so we thought that 45 would be a push, but it would sort of bring everybody up to a better, or I guess push them down for in terms of energy consumption. but. Um, even though there are some um, individual developers that are already well below that or hitting well below that threshold. So that's where we came up with the 45. Um, it and said that you could do 45 without doing PV. So the, some sites don't work well. Right. Right. So. right. so we kept, we, we re, um, we kept the green, the U.S. lead um, green building lead standard in there, but inserted the goal um, because that way it's not just necessarily about energy, but there would be some other. So if you wanted to choose that, then that might be a way to get sort of more improvements for those people who felt like they wanted to go down that path, but they wouldn't they'd have other options. So based on what you all said, you, you felt like originally the lead standard would, would really was a non-starter for most people, and right. people would just end up with a choice. <coughs> um, so, uh, hopefully this makes sense for you guys, and I know you probably want to talk about it a little bit. But when we talked about this last time, was specific to LEED, was it LEED Gold, or is it LEED it was Baseline Certification? Just Certification. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, Carolyn, India is neighboring development. Yeah. For new development. <laughs> One type I just want to make sure we don't forget about it and leave it behind. The uh, um, the not dominated by parking. Right what? now, I think the standard says it has to be dominated by parking. Okay. So, Carolyn, back to the, the lead certification. What was the thought process going from baseline certification up to gold and jumping past silver? So. <coughs> um, 
I because it's probably a little bit more strenuous than 45 than the first 45, and um, that. But it gives you there are other means to get there instead of just energy. Mm -hmm. um, um, and, and I think that um, uh, that we felt like there's it's, it's going to be pretty easy for some people to need 45. So we don't want to also lower the. It was just another way of providing an option that might be have a little bit more stringent standard, but not be totally impossible. Right. Because it was. By, by far, the, if you're just doing the certified, it would be a lot easier. I can only go turn around. Okay. Yeah, I think that's probably it. Yeah. Okay. Which was? It's 50% or more of the units no larger than 1,200. Oh, no, that should still be there. Yeah, it's D. Yeah, it's D this time around. Okay. Mm. Well, it, it's, mm -hmm. Right, there were two lead um, bullets. Okay. So we got rid of one and replaced it with, uh, we got rid of both of them and put one back as lead gold and the other one is the HERS rating. And the net zero. Right here. Oh, and we got rid of the net zero, that's right. Oh, that's right. Yeah, I think the changes are, are really good. I think they're, they're, these changes are going to better meet the goal, which is, is energy efficiency. Um, the HERS rating, I would just say, just for semantics, a HERS rating of 45 or less, just so they're not hitting. You know, right. Exactly right. Exactly it's okay if they're... Yeah. <laughs> it's okay to go in a little lower. Um, yeah, I think the, the gold, um, instead of simply certified, um, will cause a project to, to consider more things other than, than energy, or they'll have to be a combination of energy versus, you know, um, access to, to public transportation, um, community connectivity, that type of thing. Mm -hmm. So I, I think, I, I, I was pleased to see the 45. I think that's a change. So you spoke to the building department with this. Have you spoken with any feedback from developers or builders regarding this or no? No. And so, but, you know, as I said, uh, Building Commissioner will look back at the permits that he's reviewed for um, single family homes. And um, I don't know if I have my notes here, but the, the, um, the, there were just a few that were 20 or below, and they were all Jonathan Wright projects. <laughs> and then um, I think the average was um, just around 50. So we kind of looked at that and said, well, how could we, you know, push it mm -hmm. a little bit further? No, I think it's an improvement of where we were last time around, and I'm, I'm, I'm fine with it. Yep. Um, I have, I have some serious reservations about a number of these provisions. Um, I'm conscious of the fact that this is my very first meeting and I probably don't know what I'm talking about and the group has been discussing it a number of times, so feel free to ignore whatever I say. But I want to quickly go over some things that strike me. Um, well, I guess basically I'll, I'll, I'll keep myself to just two, although I have other things that bother me. The, the, number three. All projects shall include a park or civic space that serves as a focal point of the project. Um, I, I question the wisdom of that provision. <clears throat> it seems to me there could be a development in a neighborhood that's very desirable, that um, provides additional housing. Who knows, maybe it'll be 100% affordable, so it'll be um, urgently needed in the community. But it's just not possible to have a park or a civic space that's a focal point of the project. I think it's both very demanding and impossibly vague, um, which is a bad combination. Um, and um, I, I, you know, I understand. Obviously, it'd be nice if there were a park or civic space in front of everyone's house, but it 
it would be more than likely to kill any number of developments that would otherwise be desirable. The other thing that concerns me on a different subject is number eight, the, um, one, the four ABCD provisions that have to, one, one or more have to be met. I, it would certainly be very desirable if every living unit in the city and in the world um, were energy efficient. Um, you know, the wisdom of that is obvious. But I don't see it as an appropriate subject for zoning. Um, it seems to me that if a developer can sell or rent uh, a unit more quickly, and that's what the market demands, that's what they'll build. Um, and I, I don't see mixing in affordability or size of units as two of the criteria with energy efficiency seems to me um, apples and oranges or something. I, I, it doesn't seem appropriate to impose that through zoning upon developers. So those are just a couple of my concerns. I think there are other issues. The, the, the term streetscape I personally don't know what that means, and I don't think it's a defined term in the ordinance. Um, it raises questions of vagueness that could be interpreted in many different ways. So anyway, uh, you know, as I say, it's the end of the process, and it's my first meeting, so you can ignore what I say. Well, I think just to sort of the way we came up with these, these are, again, special permit criteria. When um, an applicant is, is applying for uh, development within the urban, um, sort of pre-existing urban neighborhoods for more than seven units. So there was a concern throughout this process that the larger scale projects have a greater impact in, in existing neighborhoods than the ones that might add one, two, or three units. So there was a line drawn that said, you know, six units and below is site plan approval, everything above that seven and more is special permit. So then there was a, a lot of discussion about what are the characteristics, what what is important and what makes larger projects, um, or what, what might be some of those issues that would create impacts for on a larger project or on a neighborhood from larger projects. So um, there's a lot of discussion about wanting to make sure as, you know, if we do start seeing new development in neighborhoods that, um, you know, address the civic space first, is that um, the concern was that the neighborhood could potentially be changed with one project or at least maybe a block could be changed with one project and that um, and that for you know good or bad or what have you that 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 change potentially also means the loss of open space or um, areas that were not previously developed for sure and um, adding um, which doesn't need to be a park, it can be just a park in the sense of a large land mass dedicated for, you know, ball fields or something like that, but a park is, is um, could be any size, and so the idea was some civic space, meaning some space that is for that project, um, creates some kind of relief in the landscape, on the parcel, and um, from conversations with, in public meetings, there was a concern that we not give up all of those little um, bits and pieces um, as we potentially fill in the neighborhoods. And um, so I think that, and purposefully you all talked about not wanting to define a space, a square footage size, or um, the types of things that would, that would include. So it's really up to the applicant to say, I, here I'm proposing this project with eight units, and here's how I'm going to design my site, and I've really thought about what makes sense here, and it could just be, you know, a five-square-foot little area that they've done something different with that, that um, just creates some excitement. Point. Yeah. Um, and in terms of the pick list, 
we heard a lot of comments from people with uh, again about concerns of ensuring that you know we're not pricing people out of the market that we do have opportunities to have affordable housing or at least options of scale of housing size of housing and massing and um, certainly energy efficiency was really important to people um, and again, because it's a special permit and it's for projects of a certain size, and it doesn't mean every little um, new infill project, but it really is sort of those bigger um, projects. And these are relate to all the things that are in the sustainability plan about goals and objectives to, to meet those um, that are identified as the sustainability plan. So we feel like because it's a special permit, you can further show that you're meeting goals and objectives in the sustainability plan through meeting one of these things. Yeah, I think ultimately we're talking about such a specific type of development, large-scale development, URB or C, and the thought was if that type, if we're going to let that happen, it's going to be by special permit, and with the special permit, it's going to be, it's going to happen, it's going to be done correctly. It's going to be done uh, along sustainable guidelines. Don't lose sight of green space and civic areas and so forth. So um, I'm fine with the way that the wording is ended up. So in the last section, um, I know this isn't a complete language, but I want to make sure that when we are uh, suggesting that we'll do review and approval, that we will have, uh, this sort of says that you need to show building envelope and location, so we'll get square footage. I mean, it, it sounds, uh, it doesn't sound like we're asking them much in order to come up with, with review and approval. So I'm looking for... Um, so, so, so number nine, it should be clear, and if it's not, let's change the language, that if, so always as part of special permit, you're required to file a site plan. Um, and our ordinance specifically says that you can't get a special permit until a site plan has been approved, so it's sort of flipped the other way, which means that with special permit, there's much less certainty on the part of the applicant that they're going to be able to get to do what they want to do. So um, instead of on the front end expending all this cost for engineering plans about how you're going to lay out everything, um, get a first read on the special permit before spending all that money. So this point is really saying, you can do that, you can come forward and say, okay, planning board, does this make sense? But in order to do that, you're going to have to see some baseline site plan. Right, but not I really understand the intent is to not have a developer waste money when they have no assurance at all that it's going to yeah. get through. Um, I'm just wanting to make sure that we have um, square footage and, and lot size so that we can actually determine uh, permeability and coverage. So uh, square footage is all I'm really looking for. So when we're saying building envelope and location, I'm just wanting you to nod and say, yes, that will give me the square footage. Well, I don't know that it was intended to. I think it's really more about blocks, concept blocks. So permeability, you have a standard for open space. So you have a minimum requirement. So no matter what, you guys can't waive that minimum open space. And then that relates to the stormwater. They will always need to file, if it's more than an acre, they will need to file a separate stormwater um, plan that shows the amount of impervious area versus pervious. And that is a, that's a fully engineered plan. Mm -hmm. So I think you might, in some instances, get square footage of buildings, but I don't know if you get to the level of detail of permeability versus not, because you might not have the fully <coughs> engineered streets or driveways and all of that. Okay. So are you saying, Building envelopes, you want to know precisely the square foot of the building footprint? Um, well, in other cases, like on 8C, we're actually, no, D, we're saying 1,200 square foot. You know, in, in other words, are they going to be at a point in their design where they can tell us the square footage of the buildings? Okay. So if I define yeah. a building envelope, I would think you could. I'm just looking for <coughs> I would think no, though. I, I would think, I mean, obviously, if that's the way from the take list they're getting credit, they have to tell you in one twelve hundred square feet. But for anybody else, I mean, I think about, you know, we keep using the different litmus <coughs> tests to, to test this concept. So I think about Lyme in the state, where we really want to know is where's the road going to be, where are the lots going to be. Um, so typically, a building envelope is the opposite. It's the biggest someone might do. 
Um, and then it gives the developer lots of opportunity to work with buyers, frankly, in laying out where it is. So a developer might not know what a buyer is looking for. Well, but, let's... Uh, but, but the important thing, I'm going to say as an example, of, is where's the front facade, you know, how close the street would the buildings be, where would the, the, this, the road be, but maybe not how deep into a property of the building. So if I could just add to that, the other piece of it is sort of the last sentence is, so let's say they come forward with a special permit, they say we want to do a special permit, here are generally our um, um, road alignments and, and structures, um, and in order to get that, we, we're, we're going to do 50% affordable, or we're going to do, um, sorry, 50% of the 1,200 square foot, you know, so then you're approving a special permit based on their pledge that <coughs> they're going to do that, so then that last sentence is, if that would be that to me would be a special permit threshold change. So if they then came back under the full site plan <laughs> for your approval, because they would still need to come back for a fully engineered site plan, mm -hmm. if they decided that um, they weren't going to do 1,200 square foot units and they wanted to do maybe something else in there, you could decide whether that really triggered an amendment to the special permit. <coughs> Or not, or maybe even during the review of the initial special permit, you could say we're okay if you decide to change, you know, and pick one of the other things instead. Um, that would obviously give someone a little bit more flexibility. Okay, I'm, I'm just I'm not, but it's in the back of my mind is sort of the um, hospital hill where we had an idea about what a community was going to. Like, and then as it got piecemeal built, it didn't do that. I don't know that this is the same story here, but that's what... Well, I think it's about that last line Carolyn talked about is so important is you'd have to think as a board, here's the things we're okay with developers' flexibility, and here are the character defining features. We're approving this because we believe this to be true. Yeah. And if you're going to change that, then you'd have to come back. Okay. Right. Thanks. Thanks. So what do you need from us tonight, uh, Carolyn, with respect to um, A vote on whether you're ready for this to be submitted to City Council. So then, once that happens, it would get referred out for a joint public hearing with City Council um, Ordinance Committee and Planning Board, and we've um, tentatively scheduled April 14th as that joint public hearing. Um, so, but it would need to go into Council Packet. So I need okay. a vote to say that you guys are ready to move it forward as a formal ordinance. Are we taking public input on this or no? It's up to you. You can um, if you want to do that. It's not a, you know it's not the public hearing. Right. Obviously. Okay. Is anyone here that wishes to speak regarding this item? No. Okay. Any questions from the board? No. Somebody want to make a motion? And just for the new people, obviously your vote on this doesn't determine your vote. You can all change right. your mind later. Right. 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 And vote against. You're just voting on putting it forward to city council <coughs> as an ordinance. Right. Can we abstain from voting? Because I just don't feel prepared to vote on this. Yeah. 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 So this is only a vote to submit it to the council. Right, to right. move it forward. And it'll come back. We have a joint hearing on the 14th. April 14th. Right? 14th. So it'll come back and we'll get to see it again. But and, and just, you know, the, the legal matter of we can't make changes that would make the legal ad. We can't expand the scope. So because then you couldn't suddenly add 12 new conditions. It would be more restrictive because people wouldn't know that for the public hearing. But you could take away conditions. So if you want to argue, for example, that dropping one of the things, that the board could vote to do later. But if you suddenly want to add new conditions, that you couldn't without us re advertising. <coughs> Keep going, Carolyn. Or it's been years in the making. <laughs> or do you want to jump out and then? Uh, it's up to you. I mean, I, I'm, well, we can come back to the other one. Yeah, why don't we do that since okay. all these fine folks showed up for?
believe, what's coming up next. Mm -hmm. no. You don't use that. Okay, next up, we have scheduled for 7.30, a special permit for a kennel and dog daycare at 241 Haydenville Road, Leeds, now ID 6-44. Um, just some uh, preliminary words uh, for those of you who are new tonight. Um, we have two types of hearings generally that we that we speak to. One is a site plan approval, which is generally technical in nature. It's does the does this plan that's being presented meet the regulations or not? And there's not a lot of gray here. It's, it's more black and white. Special permit is kind of step back, big picture. And does this um, project that's being presented is it right? Is it the right use for this space? Kind of a, it's, it's a broader thing, a broader, broader discussion. Um, so there's going to be a presentation. The board will, will uh, ask questions of the presenter. Then we'll go to public comment. At public comment, anybody who wants to say anything in regards to this matter, just raise your hand. Come to the podium, <laughs> give us your name and address. Uh, address questions to the board, not to the applicant. Uh, any questions at the end of the, the give and take that are still kind of hanging out there, we'll go back to the applicant and try to clean everything up before the end of the night. Um, but it's it's a it's a it's a process, so we can kind of control it, not a not a conversation that we're going to lose control of. So, um, with that being said, is there somebody making a presentation? No. Okay. Just to, um, interject one thing. Um, John Lutz has officially yes. stepped off the position of the planning board because of uh, being <coughs> a butter to the project. I'm at my Hi, uh, my name is Rachel Drossel, and I am um, one of the partners of Sam's Dog House. Let me introduce my business partners. Andrea, Chief Financial Officer, also my mother, Bob, my dad, um, general contracting and such, and my wife, Jenna, a silent partner. Um, so what Sam's Dog House is about is encouraging good relationships between people and their dogs. In the Northampton area, there is a lack of daycares that provide such services. Um, generally, in Western Massachusetts, the daycare services that are provided are, are less than veterinary. Um, and my goal is to not only have a daycare training and boarding facility, but also a community center for people and their dogs to come to if they have any behavioral questions, if they have any issues with their dogs, if they just you know need to get rid of their dog for a day because they're having the floor down or something like that. Um, but my goal is to establish trust in the community um, because people view their dogs as their children. Um, that being said, um, um, like I said, my mission, our mission statement is to encourage the relationship between dogs and their people. Um, and we provide this in a positive reinforcing atmosphere. Um, like I said, the services that we provide are boarding, training, and daycare, and all these services are based on positive reinforcement only. There's no Adversive techniques used. Um, our staff, my staff, um, have been working for me for at least a year now, so I have personally trained them. I've been in the business myself for 10 years, and I've been training people and their dogs as well as working in a daycare environment for those 10 years. Um, so, this being said, you know, I've seen what to do, what not to do, um, and one of the main concerns with daycare is behavior management. How are you going to control the barking dog bark? It echoes, you know, it, and that is, is is a nuisance to neighbors, and that is definitely something that I want to address. Um, research has shown that barking is caused by stress and over arousal levels. Um, the daycare services that I will provide um, is geared towards keeping low arousal levels, keeping visual stimulation, meaning you know instead of just uh, chain link ga gates having up stockade fences so that way the dogs can't see other things so they're not barking or reacting at things. Um, our staff are proactive in their management with dogs, meaning they use obedience before the dog actually has a chance to react. Um, barking, any barking, is dealt with immediately, efficiently, and humanely. Um, we use a variety of different techniques, um, such as gentle ears, crate timeouts, and gentle body barking, which is you're just invading the dog's face to let them know that it's not the behavior I was looking for. Um, actually, when I went around the neighborhood, a lot of the residents were thrilled to hear that there's going to be barking because of, there's apparently a bear problem in the neighborhood. <laughs> um, unfortunately, 
I am done on having a no bark zone, but I can assure you the smell of bear or the smell of dogs will probably deter the bears from um, coming around the area. Um, the next piece is waste removal. We intend having something called a doggy dooley system. And what this works as is it's essentially a septic system for dog waste. Um, there's several different <coughs> models available on a residential scale, but the one that we're going to be building is on an industrial scale. So that way it will you know, handle the amount of food that we're going to be putting in there. Um, so that will leach essentially into our leach fields. Um, all the clean products, disinfecting products, we're going to be using all natural because we do have a septic system, we're going to be using Malaluca as one of our main suppliers for cleaning products and such. Um, at this time, too, I did go around the neighborhood and talk to as many people as I could possibly get hold of, and I did get a petition in support of um, uh, dog daycare occupying this location. I have to Thanks. There was some tangible events, which I completely understand. Um, and uh, there's two other parts that I wanted to cover. Um, we are going to allow public access on the northern side of our lot um, to the conservation areas. Um, we're going to maintain that. Um, there's, we're not going to um, you know, set aside that easement. It's just going to be public access. We're going to set up our own waste doggy pickup bags and garbage cans so that way owners can be responsible and pick up after the dogs. Um, lastly, there was a, the original site plan included a second driveway, um, which did not meet the zoning requirements of um, per, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Per <laughs> um, but this, our second driveway is actually pivotal to the safety of our dogs. Um, one of the services that we hope to offer in the, in the very near future is a shuttle bus. Um, so that way, you know, it alleviates traffic mitigation, um, and it's also for ease of owners' um, convenience. Um, but that second driveway would not be used by staff, it would not be used by customers, it would be used solely for shuttle purposes. Um, we would install a gate system so that way it wouldn't be accessible, and we would put up a temporary curb. I don't know if you like parking blocks or some sort of curbing to deter any kind of parking in that area. Um, but like I said before, the shuttle bus pulls in and closes gates behind it. That way, there's no any chance of a dog escaping and running out into Route Nine. Um, and lastly, I will hand off um, mitigation, um, track mitigation and such, to Bob, um, my father. He has done a little bit of research as far as client demographics and travel patterns and such. Um, but <coughs> I'll take questions before I sit down. Any questions just yet? No, this would be better. Well, I have a question. What's the size of the building? The size of the top floor is 2,400 square feet and it does have a basement. So the, you'd be using the basement? That's right. You have the floor plans that show that as part of, so does that make your usable space for the 800? Um, well, I don't exactly know the technical classifications with residential, but when I was buying a house, there was any house that I looked at, none of the basement square footage was ever mentioned, so I kind of assumed that basement square footage is not actually counted in livable space square footage. Um, Just, um, I use a doggy daycare service, and I know when I got my dog, so I, my dogs aren't barkers, but uh, at drop-off and pick-up time, um, like you said, it causes that arousal or whatever, and you know, dogs bark excessively every pick-up and every drop-off, and, you know, my dogs don't bark. They're not barkers, but... It's They're day. in that chorus from that now. <laughs> <laughs> a lot of that is a daycare specific behavior. They have learned, you know, they're so excited to get in there that they're just barking. Um, and they're getting rewarded by it by proceeding forward into the building. Now, what's going to set me apart from other daycares is, okay, we have this problem. Your dogs only bark here. We want to resolve this. These are ways that we can help you. Um, now, my program is structured so that when dogs enter, they get the potty break, and then they get downtime, which lowers the arousal level. 
And they're not just stuck in a crate and unsupervised. There's a staff member there actually practicing quiet, practicing you know calm behaviors and basic obedience, sounds, sits, that sort of thing. At the end of the day, there's actually a routine that we're going to follow, so that way you know the dogs have their last potty break, and then they go down to settle down. And the staff member will once again practice crate training, practice basic obedience, so that way when your dog comes out, they're calm. Um, staff are not just going to get dragged out the door by the dogs. Dogs have to sit and walk politely in order to. Sit. So there's going to be rules. And dogs do best with rules, and if you're consistent with them, then they know what to expect. So if they know if they come in barking, you know, the first thing I'm going to say is, time out, gentle leader, and then they're going to know that there is a negative repercussion to them coming in barking. So they're going to come in still happy to come and play, but they're going to know that the rule is no barking. They can have fun, but no barking. And consistency is the key to that. <laughs> Thank you. You're welcome. And also, um, since we're still talking about barking, um, I did want to point out that our boarding suites are individualized rooms. And this um, with research has, especially in shelter, shelter environments, enclosed rooms, smaller areas provide less visual stimulation, which in turn provides or lowers arousal levels and thus creates a lower arousal, lower arousal environment thus less sparky dogs. Um, but the enclosed uh, boarding areas too, because they are more room-like, it'll help keep the stress levels on, thus keeping the barking down. So you have plans for up to 40 dogs? Um, is that right? 45 daycare dogs is our absolute capacity, and this is keeping in mind with um, a capacity of 15 boarding dogs. I don't believe at any time we will exceed those. Um, I am very strict about staff-to-dog ratios. Um, I'm not all about bringing as many dogs in as possible to make money. Um, my goal is for dogs to come in and learn better behaviors than what they came in with. Did, did I understand you to say that each dog will have its own enclosed compartment? No, for boarding purposes. Um, now, during daycare, our daycare operation hours are between 7 a.m. and 7 p.m. Um, and they have nap time between 12 and 2 because they're like children and they need a nap because they're cranky. Um, so it's, owners will drop off mainly between 7 and 8 um, and, and pick up mainly between 5.30 and 6.30. Um, we will have late pickup hours as well. Um,
in the area. Uh, not to mention the dozens of pet sitters, pet walkers. There's all kinds of people out there doing this. So it's unrealistic for us to expect customers to come from beyond that area. Statistically, people will not drive more than two and a half miles out of their way. Which, if you go back to the first page and you look at the numbers, the people out of Leeds, we expect just over seven customers out of Leeds, ten customers out of Haydenville, and we'd like to get 25 people out of Florence. The problem is, most of Florence that's in our target area is outside our two and a half miles. So we got to go get these dogs. And that's where a shuttle bus comes in. Uh, that's why that, the second driveway is so important to, to us. To, to keep that. It has to be fenced in when you pull the bus in because, like Rachel said, this is all about safety of the dogs. You start letting dogs run out of the school bus, they have to be contained. charge for the pickup and drop off? We'll say thank you very much. Actually, I, I think where we... It's for for to... memberships, they're, they're free, um, and depending on if it's an independent pickup, there will be a charge, but if it's an actual shuttle where we are picking up six dogs, then there will be no charge. Well, there will be one central pickup area. Mm -hmm. okay. If somebody wants us to drive to Illinois to pick up their dog, you bet we're going to charge you. <laughs> well, what about the center of Florence? No, no. The center of Florence, is, that's going to be right on our route. So there will be no charge. So nobody would have any reason to drive their dog out themselves then, if you'll pick it up for free? The only reason, I don't know if I can get a bus big enough for 25 dogs. I, I, we don't want a, a school bus. We're looking for the shorter version. Uh, I, I, don't, I don't think that, because you can't just put them on a bus. There has to be a crate. Each dog has to have an individual crate on that bus. You can't have them intermingling, having fights, hurting each other. I really don't know if you can get too many more than 12 crates on a bus. So we, we might be able to have a couple up higher for small dogs, but if I could get 12 on a bus, I'd be happy with that. And if, if things start going like we're planning, we'll get two buses. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, discussion 
Charlie Moore. Oh, sorry. Right. Nope, Mama. The final is we could slip yeah. Charlie and yeah. our the lawyer in our campaign. <clears throat> I'm going to try to confine my comments to grappling with this pigeonholing system that we have with regard to the question of mitigation. So, initially, <clears throat> Carolyn, uh, and, and obviously you folks know the way the mitigation thing is brand new to me, but uh, the problem we have is there is no doggy daycare that falls within a, or falls within a particular definition in the ordinance. And so the task is to find one which is the closest match. And initially, the thought was that the, the closest linguistic match is retail and personal services. And I am here to suggest to you very strongly that that is a very poor match indeed in terms of the purpose of the ordinance. So if you look at the definition of retail and personal services, it's about grocery stores, retail stores, shops. And the only thing related to animals has to do with grooming and sale of pet supplies, such as Dave's Pet Food City and the like. So it is contemplated by that is a pattern of continuing in and out kind of use of the property. Uh, I would suggest that the closest match, and it's very close, is human daycare. Because you're, you are performing the exact same service, <clears throat> except you're performing it for an animal versus a human being, a child. And the patterns of usage are virtually identical. Uh, and their purpose is virtually identical. You got a dog at home and both folks work. You can't leave the dog at home. It's not good for the dog. It's probably not good for your house. And so you need to put them in an environment, hopefully, that is fun and constructive and good. And so you drop them off on your way to work and you pick them up after you go to work, exactly as you would in a child care setting. The one... Uh, Distinction, which I think is important in terms of the figure, if you ever get to the question of mitigation, was pointed out to me by my daughter when I was explaining this to her this afternoon. My daughter lives in Chicago and she's out uh, because there was a death in, uh, of her very close friend. And uh, she said to me, the use isn't the same because child daycare is five days a week, typically. Monday through Friday, following the pattern of the parents' work. And Rachel would confirm that the pattern is very different for uh, <coughs> dog owners who use the service. And typically they go Tuesday and Thursday, Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. So in terms of the goal of the mitigation statute, which as I understand it, is to somehow measure the burden of increased traffic uh, on the property in question, uh, it would be, in my judgment, less than, how uh, much less who knows, but less than child daycare. But the patterns are nonetheless very similar. And the other thing I wanted to mention is that this is, if it flies with you folks, a very young business going to be run by a young individual and they're taking on a big nut. When they signed up with the seller of the property, Girl Scouts of America, and agreed to a purchase price, they had no idea whatsoever that they would be confronted with mitigation costs which could represent 30% of the purchase price. And I understand it's your job, if you get that far, to do what is fair with regard to mitigation, mitigation costs. But I would ask that that be phased in over a period of time, perhaps three years, uh, which I think it would be fair to assume uh, 
would be consistent with the gradual increase in use on the property as a new business develops. It's not going to be the same on day one as it is on after three to four years. And the final thing I wanted to touch on is the issue of this driveway. I don't know if you have a picture uh, or if you've seen the property. Okay, so there's a horseshoe, presently there's a horseshoe driveway. And there are two entrances. So you can literally go in on the right hand side if you're coming up from, uh, what is that, that driving range and heading towards Williamsburg. You could go in the first entrance and you could literally drive all the way up around and come out the second entrance. And the concern from the city, which is completely understandable, is that that's dangerous to have a busier use of that with multiple exits within a very short period of time. Totally understand that. We think we have a solution to present to you that would be something short of simply eliminating by way of creating a permanent curb in front of one of, in, in front of the first entrance to the right. Mm -hmm. And so that is what Bob had spoken about earlier. What we propose to do is to eliminate the driveway in terms of any use of it towards the back. So all of that is going to be fenced in. But what we would like to do in its place <laughs> is to erect a gate which would be limited to use solely for the shuttle service, which would enable a bus to pull in, the gate would be unlocked, and then the bus would drive in and the dogs could be safely gotten into the facility. And that would be the sole use uh, that we propose. Otherwise, it would be shut off for any other use by employees, excuse me, employees or um, customers of the facility. That also speaks to the issue of mitigation in terms of actual use by cars. So the greater the use that we can have by a single bus carrying 10 dogs, 8 dogs, whatever, that means you have, instead of 8 cars coming in, you have one bus, which lessens the impact on the road even further. And I think that, too, could be considered in terms of the dollar amount of mitigation, again, if you get that far. So just to clarify, that first entrance would be used exclusively for the show. Exactly. The second entrance, then, would be used for the public. Yes, so and for employees. And for employees. So if you have five cars dropping off, how do they get in and out of that second entrance? What's the pattern? There's a parking lot in the back, mm -hmm. and they drive in. And they would exit the same driveway. So Horse through around and come back out. Yeah. Okay. So the shuttle will not go around. No. I, I don't know if I have liberty to approach the. Can I just draw a quick picture? Sure. On the show and tell. Uh, yeah. Sorry. So. Yeah, I will. I watch. Over here. What's that? Oh, okay. All right. So, roughly speaking, you have what? You got. You got um, group nine here. Then you got the first entrance here, and that's the one we're talking about. And then you've got like. A second entrance, which would be the only entrance. And currently, what you have is a driveway that runs all the way around like this. Okay? That's not very good. All the way around like that. So what's gonna what we would propose to do is to install, I got this messed messed up, but the gate would be like here. It would be locked and limited. Uh, to the shuttle service, there would be signs indicating that. Uh, it would be opened, the shuttle bus would park, it would then be completely enclosed. All of this is going to be gone. So the reason I ask is how does that bus turn around? It's not backing out on the route 9. Oh, that's, 
No, there's plenty of space to turn around. There's plenty of space. Okay. So, um, I'll be driving it. Good point. Proposals? I don't know. You're going to have to plan on how to do it. Yeah. So the plan would be for this to turn around and go out that way, not back up. And that's doable, yes or no? No, I, I don't know how you're going to do that. I, I couldn't hear you. I'm sorry, barking dogs for too many years. <laughs> what was the question? Um, if you're using the downhill entrance for the shuttle bus, mm -hmm. I, I need you to explain to me how you're going to turn that around in that area. Um, I believe it is a 15-foot driveway. Yeah. Right. Right now it's a 15-foot driveway. But in the process of eliminating all of that drive around, drive uh, park, uh, driveway, I mean, you've got all the plans there in front of you. We've got a ton of work for excavators, and we will make sure that we have enough room inside that fenced area to make a K-turn with that bus. It, it, no, we won't have it backing out on Route 9. Uh -uh. I, I, where, how, where's the lot line over there between where the house, how far from the house is the lot line? To the neighbors on either side? No, just the lot line because you can you can add to the lot line on the side if there's enough space there. Oh, there's, 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 oh, there's plenty of space there. There's plenty of space there. <laughs> there. It's probably a, yeah, especially on that side. Thank you. That's all I have. Thank, Thank you very much. Thank you. Any questions before we open up the public? I'm curious how many staff people will be yeah. coming along. How many staff people would be driving in and out daily? Um, there would be a minimum of three staff on duty, um, and that's assuming an average of five to ten dogs a day. Um, we would have no more than five staff on premises at any time. There would be somebody there 24 hours a night because we are offering 24 hour supervision, so there would be at least one staff there at all times. Anybody else? Okay, we're going to open up uh, to comments by the public. If you could raise your hand, I'll call them. Just come up to the podium, uh, give us your name and address, and uh, Louise, uh, Louise Canis. Two twenty one Haydenville Road. I am the closest abutter to the proposed uh, panel. Uh, I sent, uh, I brought a letter to Mr. Fiden on Tuesday yep. and asked if everybody on the planning board would receive it. Mm -hmm. So uh, I think everybody has had a chance to read it. And basically, that outlined everything that I was concerned about. Um, we were talking just now about the driveway. The driveway as it exists now is really a one-lane driveway. It's not a two-way thing. Um, and I don't expect that two cars can pass each other, going one going in and one going out. Uh, it's hard for me to visualize. I've lived next door to the Girl Scout building for over 20 years. It's hard for me to visualize how a bus is going to get in there and make a turn if they're not going to just go all the way around and out the other side. There is a parking area there, but um, the, the excavation and so forth, all of that kind of escapes me right now. I can't visualize it, what it is. <coughs> I guess what I'd like to do is kind of reiterate some of the things that I've said that I think are uh, pretty applicable. Um, one is the distance of my place from, uh, from my building to their building. A couple of days ago, I went out with a yardstick. <laughs> I literally measured yardstick by yardstick from my building to the Girl Scout building. And that is 20 yards. That includes, of course, uh, my driveway and their driveway. 
And then I measured uh, from the side of my driveway to the side of their driveway, which is only a distance of 10 yards. And that is actually crossing the lot line. So that uh, the lot line is even uh, less than 10 yards from my driveway. All of which is saying, I'm awfully close. And maybe, you know, that's why I wrote this letter. I am the one who is most concerned. I did speak to a number of other neighbors, and uh, they were concerned, but they were not able to be here tonight. Um, the first thing I did when I heard about this, Rachel came and talked to me, and I was very interested in her idea. I think it's you know a wonderful entrepreneurial idea. The big problem I have with it is not in the right place. I went to the building inspector's office and found that this is zoned suburban residential. And I sort of breathed a sigh of relief at that because I counted on that to be the case. And uh, then, of course, I got the uh, letter from or the, the listing of tonight's uh, hearings, and I find that there is a special permit being requested, which would overturn the suburban suburban resident, uh, residential <coughs> status. Um, it is suburban residential. Everybody around there is. Uh, in a, in a residence, and, and most people have been, been there for quite a few years. Um, some are not as close, some are across the highway, and, and uh, perhaps don't feel as strongly about it as I do. The, uh, the case that Rachel makes for working with the dogs so that you're going to have this quiet, calm, controlled environment it, I think it looks fine on paper, but I don't buy it. I have owned dogs almost all of my life. I know how excitable they are. Barking is the way they communicate with each other, whether they're happy or unhappy or, or whatever. This is, this is what they do. Um, I cannot envision all of these animals coming in every day whether they're coming in on a bus or coming and being individually dropped off, I cannot imagine that this is going to be a quiet environment. Twice a day there's going to be a lot of noise. There's going to be training taking place and dogs get excited as well during that. Working with dogs individually, this idea of positive reinforcement is good. I do it with my dog too. But when you're walking into a room and it has, you know, 14 dogs in it, which I did last week because I had my dog in a kennel somewhere for a couple of days, walking in, you know, in two minutes, every one of them is barking. The first one starts, the second one picks it up, and in, in the ensuing minutes, every one of them was barking their heads off, and I could not hear the man talking to me, showing me where my dog would be. They were all in individual spaces, individual cages, um, so they weren't at each other, but they were just barking out of pure excitement. The, I, I took my dog in for her annual physical yesterday, and I talked to the vet. I simply said, there is a proposal to have a, a, a kennel, a dog kennel, next to my house. And I'm a little worried about the quiet. And she said, that's the end of quiet. And she laughed. And that's all we said about it. The other thing uh, that the neighbors and I have talked about is the traffic. The traffic on Route 9 is amazing. And I've mentioned that in the letter. When I say cars and trucks of all kinds are barreling up and down at 45 and 50 miles an hour, I, I'm not uh, you know, overstating it. I'm not really worried that the dog's safety because of the dog safety because of what 
thing was said about the fences and so forth, although there was always the possibility. Uh, but I, I am concerned about the noise. I'm concerned about the noise from the dogs, and I'm concerned about the noise from the traffic all the time. I have a breezeway, and in the summertime I cannot sit in the breezeway quietly and, and enjoy reading a book because the traffic is uh, tremendous almost all day long. The other uh, matter uh, that I mentioned in my letter is the building that is going on uh, at Linda Manor, a three-story, large three-story building uh, connected to Linda Manor, and uh, that is going to add to the traffic. We anticipate that it's going to add. You know, a lot of this, we don't know for a fact, but we can anticipate from past experience. In the 20 years that I've been there, the traffic on Route 9 has increased unbelievably. It's going to increase with that building, when that building opens, with the professional staff coming and going, and, and, and uh, uh, regular staff, uh, and visitors, and so forth. That's going to increase. And so I see myself living next door to a place where traffic is Coming in, a lot of uh, dogs will be dropped in by car, individually. If I'm coming from the hill towns or if I'm coming up from Florence uh, and it's not too long a distance, why would I not drop off the dog myself rather than take to have it done? The other matter um, was that of doing the community a favor somehow by allowing them to use your property to go into the conservation lands in the back. The conservation lands abut my property, closer actually than it does next door. But uh, it, it unnerves me a little bit to have the, uh, the idea that there are a lot of strangers walking around in the woods behind my house. I can see them, especially uh, in, a, in a time when uh, the leaves are falling and there are lots of people wanting to enjoy the woods. <coughs> there is an access farther down, opposite the driving range. There is a roadway in there. People could go in there and you know wander around in there without coming so close to those of us who are living there. There are no fences. We just have the open woods behind our homes. So that idea was also uh, alarming to me. The other thing that I mentioned in my letter was this matter of dogs running loose in the woods, because I've seen this now three times. And in fact, I mentioned it to Rachel when she came to my house that someone whom I did not know had come to that parking lot and uh, had something like a half dozen dogs with him, I believe it was a, a, a man, and uh, they were unleashed and they came racing toward my dog who was in a penned-in area in the back. I was out there with them. It came racing toward the dog, and I was alarmed because I didn't see the person. I thought it was a wild dog pack. They were very excited you know, to see my dog. My dog got all excited. And then this uh, man called them. They came back, and off they all went, unleashed into the woods. So this happened three times. I, I was pretty concerned. I'm not the only one who saw it. Another one of the neighbors said they saw it. So, in the end, um, these are all the things that I worry about, but I also, very frankly, worry about the, the uh, uh, value of my home. I am going to be considering selling it sometime within this next decade, as I get older and, and less able to take care of, uh, of the property. I will probably want to sell it. And I would be rather upset if ten or twenty thousand dollars were chopped off the price because someone said it's next to Sam's doghouse. 
I'm not sure how many people here would actually entertain the idea of buying a house <coughs> to a panel. So in the end, I want to say, I think, you know, Rachel has a wonderful idea. I think you know, can use something like that. And I only think it should be somewhere in a more rural area or an area where you don't have people living close by. That's my case. Thank you. Can I help and answer Rachel's question, just to clarify something? Let's, let's get all the comments from everybody, and then we'll kind of vote them up, and then have Rachel respond at the end, maybe. Yes. <coughs> Suzanne Smiley, and I live in Gill, Massachusetts, but I represent the Girl Scouts. We own the building. We've owned the building since 1965, built it for the Girl Scouts. We have... Um, at that time, they were, were able to issue a use variance. So we were there by a use variance, which you can't do anymore on the conventional variance. But the special, the, the zoning now, by special permit, does allow a kennel in, in the residential agricultural area. The reason I wanted to talk a little bit is because I wanted, I think people think of the Girl Scouts as a very low impact use, and I don't think they work. <laughs> a low impact use there. Um, the conservation land, first of all, that was that we're talking about, the Girl Scouts own the two acres that you're talking about now, but also 40 acres behind. It goes behind the two abutters and straight back. The town, Wayne Fine, came to me, and I was the director since 1989 at that location. So Wayne came to me and he, he approached us to sell the 40 acres behind for a conservation area, which we thought it was a great use. We have trails and things there, and they have been open to the public. We had checked with our attorney. We had no limitations on that. We had a little donation box there. We publicized the trails. As well. We have a half, had a half mile loop that was handicapped accessible. So there was a habit of people coming in and out already using this trail. Um, and the town asked us during those land transitions um, if we would grant a right-of-way so that people from Route 9 could come through. And we denied that because we thought it would be obvious that our parking lot that already exists there and people are used to using, people would keep using that parking lot. So we didn't want to set up a right-of-way um, for, for the next owner. They would just assume that they would be able to get through to the conservation area. But it has been used, and we did work with the town to do that. The traffic patterns, we had, when we were there, we had 15 to 17 staff members in that building. We were using the both floors, the basement and the top, for office space throughout. Those the kinds of jobs we had aren't the kind where you come, park your car, and stay. In and out, in and out. Recruiting volunteers, training volunteers, going to meetings, coming in and out at night. We had board meetings there on evenings, weekday evenings. So we'd be there usually about 20 people, 20 separate cars. They're from board meetings, I can't remember, 6.30 to 9, we'd be there till 9.30 cleaning up. So it's, um, there was, we generated our significant own traffic, but we also had a store there where we sold badges and patches that the girls would earn, uniforms, things like that. So we had people coming in and out all the time. We had um, training that we did, many evening and weekend training. We had weekend events, some of them try not to do this very often, maybe once a year we would have a large event where we had cars parking all over the place and we shuttled them from other locations to the property. Um, cookies, Girl Scout cookies, <laughs> the way we deliver Girl Scout cookies is we have troop leaders coming, we had kind of basically became a warehouse of cookies, cases of cookies. We would have troop leaders coming constantly during probably January through March, so three months. 
picking up cookies, exchanging cookies, you know, coming in and out all the time. And that driveway we certainly used. People would come in that bottom part. There is kind of a, a turnout where they would park, load up their cookies, go around and come out the other way. The problem was when we had the delivery trucks bring the cookies, they would bring big semi-trucks. And they couldn't even negotiate the, the turn to go around that driveway. So oftentimes, they end up stopping on Route 9, backing up into our driveway. Or if they could make the turn into our driveway, they would back up again onto Route 9. So you have semis for years backing in and out on Route 9. I think, I think this is really a less impact than the Girl Scouts have done. Um, we were the only office for 4,000 girl members throughout Western Massachusetts. So we had a fair amount of traffic, I, you know, through the day and into the nights and the weekends as well. And I think that's all I wanted to say, just to give some context of what the use was since 1965 until one year ago, more than a year ago. Thank you. Now, of course, there's no use. I mean, we come probably twice a week. We have people there. We did have cookies there um, this year, but we brought them instead of the semi. We brought them in a pickup truck, but we still have people coming in and out to, to pick up cookies. So we use the building, but um, from what we did, the last year has been a whole different story. Thank you. Thank you. Anybody else? Yes, in the back. Hi. I'm Nancy Magabrano, and I live at 80 Leonard Street, which is just across the street. Um, <clears throat> I won't go over everything my neighbor said, but obviously I have all of her concerns. Um, I'll just try to add to it so that I can be quick. Um, one of the things is um, the wildlife. We have, we have tons of wildlife in the area. I happen to like the bears that are in my backyard. Um, they move across the street. One of my concerns is, is that with the barking dogs, we will have more movement back in Cross Route 9 and a uh, possibility of more accidents. That's one thing. Um, the activity she spoke, I've lived there for 13 years. I've never seen that kind of activity at the Girl Scouts. Right. Yeah, I've never seen, I've never seen semi-tractor trailer trucks there. I'm sorry, I haven't. Um, I've seen cars parked there for like a meeting. I know people just cars parked there and then the cars were gone maybe a couple times a week and that's all I've ever seen going on there. Um, another thing that concerns me is the driveway that they're going to be using is the closest um, to Leonard Street, which is already kind of a dangerous intersection. Um, it was supposed to be taken care of and then the money went to the yellow line down the road and the extra times and stuff like that. But anyway, so that concerns me. And um, my neighbor had mentioned Linden Manor. Uh, the thing that concerns me about Linden Manor is that with that new facility, they're going to have a lot of people at difficult times of their life are going to be within earshot of this. Mm -hmm. And when I went to Linden Manor, it's probably outside the zone of who would get notified because nobody had told them about this. And so I went and I dropped off one of the letters that the planning board had said so that they would know about it. Um, I'm just trying to skip through so I don't uh, worry. Um, I think probably that and, of course, the issue she had with the house. Obviously, there is a financial issue. I would not buy a house that was next to a town. Um, I would say that it sounds like a great idea. I didn't get a chance to talk to Rachel when she came around the neighborhood, but I did YouTube her. And she seems like she's very confident and a very fine person, and I wish her well, but just not in that neighborhood. I can't. I think that's all. Well, okay. Thank you. Okay. Anybody else? John. My name is John Lutz. I'm at 291 Hayden Mill Road, uh, which is the third house up north of the uh, proposed site. And I'll just try and go quickly through the, uh, some concerns that, that I have. Um, first of all, the, the primarily is the change of use. I mean, we're talking about going from a business, a commercial entity, 9 to 5, sometimes in the evening, sometimes on weekends. I've lived there for 11 years and would not have the experience. I've never seen trucks. I've never seen a 
overcrowded parking lot. You know, it's a commercial, small commercial entity uh, to a 24-7, uh, as if I did my math right, somewhere in the neighborhood of hopefully 35 or 40 dogs a day coming and going. It just seems like a very dramatic change in use from, from what has been there for many years. Uh, the traffic, uh, you know, in pure numbers, of course, we're down very busy. If you dropped in, you know, a thousand cars, it wouldn't be that big a you know, But the reality is it's a very dangerous place. Uh, I've said many times the most dangerous thing I do every day is pull out of my driveway. Uh, if I can get out of it safely and my daughter gets out of it safely, then we have a good day already. So it, it's a very congested place. Leonard Street intersection, the two driveways, the hill, the speeds. So, you know, it is a very dangerous place. Um, you know, the noise, uh, lifelong dog owner, I have a dog now. Uh, you know, 35 or 40 dogs, you know, I would have to agree, you know, all best intentions, you know, they're dogs, and they're going to be dogs, and, you know, anybody that has one or has ever had one knows that that is going to happen, and they're going to react like dogs. Um, I am, and carrying that, I'm actually worried about, because I think, if I know correctly, I think each of us that is within a couple or three houses of the site all have dogs. So I'm also a little worried about, well, what is the impact on our dogs? of 40 dogs, relatively close, dogs are very sensitive, they have good hearing, they have good smell, all those things. What's it gonna to do to the quality of life for our dogs if there's this constant presence of all these other dogs? Um, I know what it's like when I see one other dog with my dog on the bikeway and we're walking, you know, they act like dogs and you know, things like that. So, uh, concerned about that as well. And, and finally, I think it's a very uh, uh, relevant fact about the uh, adverse impact or potential adverse impact on existing property values. Obviously, folks that have purchased there for in, in the past years, it wasn't a kennel. I mean, it was a commercial entity, yes, I understand that, but it was an office. Uh, maybe a busy, even if it was a busy office, it was an office. It was nine to five, it wasn't on the weekends primarily, all those things, and this would be a really different change. And I don't think, you know, I think any reasonable uh, estimate would be that it would adversely impact people's <laughs> Uh, my name is Kim Greerwert. I live at 297 Hayden Boulevard. Um, I don't think it's a good idea. I don't think it's a good idea to really increase a lot of activity around that property. I think the, the, the zoning of the area at, at suburban residential is very specific. I think also it does a lot of special permits. But at some point in time, you have to draw a line as to how many special permits are going to be issued. Because at some point in time, if you issue enough special permits, then it's no longer the intent of the zone. So I just want you to be, be aware of that. At some point in time, the line has to be drawn, and enough will be enough. And uh, I would hope this will not go through. Thank you. Thank you. Anybody else?
Can I just add something? Okay. Anybody else has anything? No, yes. Okay. Um, I just wanted to add, I mean, these are our homes. And the thing is, is that um, it's not that it's something new. It's something that if we want to spend some time sitting in our yard, um, we can't. If we want to have our windows open in the summer, it's going to affect us. Um, so I think that it, it's not so much that it's a new use or anything like that. It's just the change is going to change our quality of life, you see. And I, like my neighbor, sometime in the next 10 years, <coughs> I'm probably going to want to retire, maybe sell my home or something like this. And so it, it, it just seems to me, um, what recourse do we have if we go ahead with this plan? And I'm a dog person too. If we go ahead with this plan and we okay it, and there is a problem, as we talked about and we worry about, what recourse do we have at that point to solve that problem? You know, it just doesn't seem to me like there's going to be anything that we can do about it. We would just have to live with it. We lose our quiet. We lose the chance to find a buyer for our homes when we're ready to sell. Um, you, the effect of the wildlife, the effect of the people who are staying at Linda Manor. That's the thing that worries me. You know, because once you, once it's a done deal, it's a done deal. You know, and I don't want to have to be calling the police you know, with the noise complaints and stuff like that. I tend to be a live and let live person. Um, and as I said, I, I love dogs. I'm allergic to them, but I love dogs. Um, I just I just think a w more rural area would be a little bit better spot. Thank you. Rachel, do you have anything to add? Yes. Um, I don't know why I should direct this. <laughs> probably. Um, <laughs> There is actually, there's two daycares in Massachusetts. It's Pawsville and Canine Capers. Um, these two daycares, they have no barking policy. You walk in there, you can hear a dying drop. Now, I was trained by the owner of Canine Capers, who is Heather Stouts. Um, and I, like I said before, I've been doing this for 10 years. So just, and I've lost my hearing. So my goal is to keep the barking down. I don't, you know, the dogs will not be outside unsupervised barking their heads off any barking that it, it would be immediately dealt with. Um, and my staff, like I said before, they've been working with me for a year, two years, three years. A lot of them I take, I've taken on private training lessons, a lot of them with dogs who bark. Um, we have a very simple but yet very effective means of teaching a dog what the word quiet means. Um, and it's actually a very effective cue in the methods that we use. It's very it's simple, it's efficient, and it's consistent, and it's very effective for the dogs. I invite anybody to go to Canon Capers or it's possible and you will be extremely like floored by the silence. And this is because you keep small play groups, you keep small staff to dog ratio, so that way the, the staff can focus on their small group of dogs. Ten dogs, one dog's barking, one quick little play bark, you know, all that requires is a little body block, you just invade the dog's face. Um, something like dogs bark for different reasons. They have motivations for it. So when you went to go pick your dog up, all these other dogs saw your dog leave. Everybody, of course all the dogs are going to go nuts because, you know, they get jealous in their own little doggy way. Um, but with my facility, the number one thing that I'm going to limit is visual stimulation. That is the number one thing for dogs barking. Territorial, um, play barking, and also like fear barking. Those are several of the main types of barking that you'll find in a dog. The number one barking that you'll find in daycare is territorial or high arousal, meaning visual stimulation, my friend's going home and I'm not. Um, during go home time, the dogs will have their downtime, so they're not going to see their friends leave. Each dog will be brought out individually, so that way we won't even bring them out to, the, to mom or dad until they're calm, cool, and collected. Um, I've worked with many dogs who would scream on the way out, and it might have taken me a week or two, but that dog knew that she needed to be in a nice down with her little face on the floor and quiet in order to proceed. Um, and with consistency, consistency, you can teach any dog this. Um, and I completely understand, you know, the valuation of um, property and whatnot. Um, and that, you know, being next to a doggy daycare, I can completely understand your concerns with that. Um, if I had the money, I would offer to buy up your house so I can have my staff live next door. <laughs> It'd be easier for that way. Um, but 
I know everybody's number one concern is the parking, and behavior management is my number one concern, and parking falls underneath that. Um, and I don't want to devalue anybody's home property value. I don't want, you know, it's a nice day in June and you're out on your porch drinking your tea. I don't want to, you to hear dogs barking. Um, so this is why I say my staff are, and myself are very consistent in making sure that, you know, appropriate behaviors are being practiced. And, you know, any inappropriate behavior is dealt with immediately, efficiently, and kindly and humanely. Um, and that's my goal, to be a community center. I know there's a lot of dog owners in the area, and there's a huge cultural gap. And my mission is to explain the differences between dogs and people, so that way it helps dogs with relationships, which include, you know, how do I get my dog stopping from barking when they're going in out of daycare, that sort of thing. Um, and it's not just going to be drop your dog off and pick them up. We're going to give behavior, you know, your dog, you know, they're okay on sits, we need to work on downs, they bark a lot. We're going to work on that, okay? You need to teach your dog how to wait because they keep bolting out of gates. Here's how to do that. So it's not going to be a, bring me your dog, I'll take care of your money, we'll do whatever all day. It's about bettering the human-dog relationship. And, you know, as a trainer, I like to teach people. I like to teach people about the cultural differences. And that, in itself, you know, I believe would be a huge benefit to the community. Thank you. Um, as I understand it, Rachel, you'll have like 35 to 40 dogs per daycare after a year and a half. Oh, I'm thinking that probably is like a three-year number. Um, well, your application says you would have 15 within six months and then increase at five each quarter, which, as I figure, after a year and a half, that puts you at 35. So, whatever, call it 30. Th those are, those are over-exaggerated okay. numbers because the bank does like to slash those types of numbers, right. so that was taken. Well, so I'll call it 30. Plus the, the boarding dogs, there would be, what, 10 of those? Yeah, no, no more than 15. So, um, but so then you're up to over 40 dogs, 45 dogs, even conservatively, mm -hmm. it seems. I mean, assuming things go as you hope. Mm -hmm. um, so I don't understand two things then. One, how you could have individual containment areas for each one of them. And second, how you can have a small staff to dog ratio but only have three to five staff. Um, we have three, we have actually five different playrooms if you don't count the evaluation rooms. Um, we keep a one to ten staff dog ratio, that's $40. Um, if we, during boarding season, numbers of course take up. Um, so that, you know, that there will be a small fluctuation with that. Um, there will always be, you know, a lobby staff member. Um, so that person technically doesn't count as part of the dog to human ratio. Um, the person on the lobby receiving the dog is not part of that ratio. Um, now with those numbers, 10 dogs may seem like a lot, you know, a lot of people just have one dog, or like your friend brings over a second dog and you're like, oh my god, that's a lot of dogs. But 10 dogs in the daycare environment really is a small group, which is a very easily manageable group um, and getting back to behavior, it encourages. So would they each have their own enclosed area, as you've described? The boarding dogs would have their own enclosed area to sleep in. The daycare dogs would be separated according to temperament, size, play style. Um, you know, there's some little dogs who play like big dogs, so we're going to put them with medium dogs. Um, but during the nap time, you know, they will have their each enclosed area, whether it's a crate or a 4x4 four four or 6x8 or 4x6, um, or if they're part of the boarding program and the sleep with staff program, then they would be hanging out with staff for the nap time. Um, but the outdoor area, there's three separate outdoor areas, one main large area for the big dogs, and two smaller areas, um, one for the small dogs, one for mainly for a boarding layout area. Um, and all fencing has stockade fencing, and we'll have stockade fencing around the exterior. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions? We're good. Yes. My name is Anita Lyfen, and um, I li I'm a resident of East Hampton, but I work for the Franklin County CDC. And uh, we worked with Rachel with her plan for the past seven months, developing this idea. 
And uh, we were skeptical, as a lot of you were, about this barking issue because it was part of a larger group and we thought, See, how do you have all these dogs without barking? Um, when we looked into it further, we looked into it using um, a lot of the research that you get. We got at the UMass Library, the Mintel reports. It's the way that Rachel is going to be doing this program is exactly what they're doing now in larger cities. Um, if you go to New York and you go to places like Trump Towers, they have dog daycare in the lobby of these new high-rise um, apartment facilities. And it is actually the trend that more people as we go on will be dealing with dogs like Rachel intends to deal with dogs because this move back to urban areas but also wanting to have a dog, it's all kind of getting rolled into your living space. And, and that's what we're pro they're projecting for the future is that in large apartment complexes there will be dog daycare available on site. And it's going to be done by people using the methods that Rachel has really spoken about. I think the reason why we haven't seen those methods is widely used around here is that some daycare centers have the luxury of being in the middle of nowhere where it's just not been an issue. But um, I was actually in New York. I visited the ones that are in the basement. There are six apartment buildings and there are dog daycare in each one of those buildings. You can hear a pin drop. And it's by using these training techniques. And what they're saying is that then these, these um, tenants of these buildings then get to take the dogs to dinner with them. They're now allowing dogs in the, um, in the department stores in New York. And even in Manchester, Connecticut, in Evergreen Walk, it's a dog-friendly walking outdoor mall. So it is the trend, and the dogs that are going to these different places and availing themselves these opportunities are being trained by the likes of Rachel and the methods that they're using currently to train dogs for the new experiences going forward. You know, like we've been talking about in Northampton, a lot of people allow dogs in their stores. I mean, 10 years ago, that was really not a priority, but people want to take their dogs everywhere. And um, so, from the CDC standpoint, we work with about 10 other people that have dog daycare and boarding and grooming facilities. And this is absolutely the wave of the future. And, and Rachel has captured this probably better than anyone we work with in terms of understanding the ramification of returning a well-behaved dog back to the owner who can then go to a restaurant and sit outside with their owner can go to stores and um, provide that companionship that all the research shows that people really want. So we were very excited. We wanted very much to be involved financially with this business. We are here to create small business and create jobs. And we felt very strongly about it. She's going to be self-financing, but we absolutely would have put our money where our mouth is on this one. She's, she understands it. and. She's right on trend for what people want for the quality of life in their community is this type of facility. Okay, thank you. Um, I did not include this in any of the paperwork that I submitted, but I do have an article about noise in the animal shelter environment. Um, and it's, it essentially covers everything that I have said about, you know, visual stimulation, making sure that the psychological, you know, stressors of the dog have been, um, it's all highlighted. <laughs> um, so I don't know if the, a decision would be made tonight or if there would be further deliberations. Um, but those, I did do a bunch of research on barking and, you know, my general knowledge of, you know, how to keep the dog in a low-stress environment and how to keep barking down to a minimum. Um, and then I did a bunch of additional research, um, and that's what I came up with. So if there's okay. any question about, you know, professional opinion on how to reduce sparking and what in, in like what kind of environment is best for a dog and how like structurally wise and, and floor plan wise, how to design a facility in which that inhibits sound and that creates a, the least visually distracting area, so that way the dogs remain as quiet as possible. Um, I also have cliff notes too, if you prefer those. Because <laughs> that's a long article. 
I have a question I'd like to ask Rachel. Yeah, if you can ask, ask, ask the board and then we'll, we'll deliberate and then Rachel oh, okay. can wrap up. Okay. My question is, um, of all the dogs that are coming in for daycare, people are paying for, for daycare a certain number of hours per day, how many of those dogs are you actually going to be training with your uh, the principles of behavioral management, which sounds great to me when you're working with individual dogs, but if you have 30 or 40 dogs, how are you going to train them? Are, is there going to be group training, or can you only do it with individuals? And do you have to pay extra for this training if you bring your dog in for daycare? Okay. Um, the training, basic sits, downs, <coughs> excuse me, name recognition, and wait at gates, those are all training that, go, that come with the daycare program. Because um, the, the groups have a very small, you know, 1 to 10 ratio, it's, I can get a group of 25 dogs to sit, wait, off a gate 8 feet, believe it or not, believe it or not, 25 dogs, seriously. <laughs> Quiet, sitting, waiting, no pushing, no shoving, no yelling, it's, it's, it, it's possible. And if you get a dog who has a hard time learning that weight command, <coughs> then an additional staff member would come in a room, occupy the other dogs, while that one person was working on the, the sit weights, or, you know, the weight at the gates. Um, another very important um, part of our program is going to be the come sit, which every staff member is going to practice at least a dozen times with every dog in the room. And this is, I mean, what this is, is there's going to be a treat bucket in the corner of the room. The staff member is going to say, come sit. All ten dogs are going to come running towards them and sit, so that way if a new dog's coming in or a new dog's going out, there's no, there's no issues at the gate, so that way the dog can eat. if a dog's going home, they can leave without any kind of gate issues. There's no extra charge for that. Um, we do have a board and training program where we, you know, can teach basic obedience to advanced obedience. Um, we also have, you know, a variation of training classes, which is separate from our daycare program. But our daycare program actually includes all that reinforcement of, you know, known behavior, sit down, wait, and the name recognition as well. And we also practice it in daycare, so it's a higher it distraction environment, so that way your dog will actually listen to you better, you know, out and about, because they have that practice and that distraction level. Thank you. Okay. So we've had a lengthy discussion on all things dog care related. Uh, questions from the board or discussion on the board? Um, I think it would be useful for Carolyn to clarify what the special permit is, particularly in the context of what we're doing here and with the special permit as opposed to the site plan. I know sure. Mark did a minute ago, but so yeah. in, in the conversation there's been different opinions on whether this is an appropriate use of the public. Sure. So would you give us some more on that? Yeah, I mean that's sort of. Um, your jurisdiction under special permit is to determine whether a proposed use, which is identified in the zoning as potentially allowable, if, a, if you can show that you're meeting the special permit criteria in the zoning, it's not by right and you just go through a process, it's special permit for a reason, and that is, does it make sense, the proposed use in the given location, <coughs> including the context, are um, technical issues addressed, are um, issues about impacts to, um, you know, open space around the neighbors, um, you know, does it fit in the context of the sustainability plan and the plan zone. So, you know, issues about, um, I think noise is, is, you know, important. I think they've addressed some of the traffic concerns in terms of the curb cuts. I think that certainly seems like a reasonable uh, compromise to um, only had one of those driveway cuts used for, you know, shuttle activity. Um, but I think in terms of, um, <coughs> excuse me, impact to the neighborhood and the proximity to other houses, I think that's probably the crux of your decision at this point is, does it, given all the things that you've heard and, and sort of the context of the neighborhood, um, does it make sense here? And would you be able, and I know it was before your time, but can you tell me how the commercial business of the Girl Scouts was granted for that lot? 
when it was given? And what was that a what what was, what's that history that I that creates this business in that residential area? Well, it doesn't really. Uh, well, uh, so the Girl Scouts were granted a variance back in the late sixties and. Um, we actually do allow membership clubs by special permit in this district now, so we would probably classify it as that, but it is sort of a back office use. It's a different type of commercial use. Um, so there are sort of limited kinds of uses that might be allowed in the rural residential district which, in which this is located. Um, the kennel um, use is one of them. Um, for personal, yes, I mean, it depends. So a horse, if you have a horse farm that's a commercial agricultural kind of um, use, that's allowed in the district. Um, but that has a whole nother, that's under, that could potentially be fall under the agricultural um, provisions of the zoning ordinance, which is very um, forgiving for those types of uses. So it's a little, it's a different kind of, the way the zoning deals with it is a different classification than kennel. Does kennel fall under agriculture? No. Okay. And if the Girl Scouts were coming to us today instead of this business, they would still be, they would today have to get a special, special permit program. to do the, the business that's there. Um, right. I will double check to confirm, but we would probably look at it as a, well, we would either look at it as a, um, <coughs> Membership club, which requires special permit, actually from the city council. Um, it, it's possible they might fall under the exemptions for educational use, depending on what part of, depending on the nature. But it might fall under that exemption as well. So it's a, it's a really a different animal. Okay, so thank you. Carol, yeah. uh, um, isn't that important for us to know the use category? I mean, this is the closest thing we have in the ordinance is a kennel, yep. right? Yep. Kennel does appear under the overall category of agricultural use, but but they're not all agriculture. I mean, it just happens to be, but still, it's it's um, that's why they're here before the planning board because it's a kennel in the RR zone. Right. So, uh, but what? Okay. What about what about section ten point eight of, of the ordinance? It, as I read that, that requires ten acres for a kennel. Um, so the, it does group commercial stables and kennels. We've always, whenever we've had a commercial stable, we've looked at it for this 10, for this uh, minimum acreage, and of course everything else in here is about stables and riding rings. Um, Actually, I didn't um, catch this before, but um, the way that it is grouped here um, would raise the question that, you know, potentially that you need 10 acres. And um, I know we've had, um, the interesting thing, we've had kennel applications come before that didn't have 
10 acres. They weren't, I don't know if you guys remember on Kennedy Road, yeah. there was one, and it actually didn't get approved because of the same issue of proximity to housing. Um, but yeah, the way this was lumped together, it said the minimum acreage is 10 acres. So they have two. Seems excessive, yeah. but still, that's. Right. Seems to be what it says. Anybody else? Yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah question no about, so um, if a special permit was granted for uh, the kennel use, um, does that mean that someone, an another business could come in, another kennel could come in, in, in this location? Well, typically, yes, the use, the permit would be granted to the use, however, you would have the authority to limit it to this specific applicant that doesn't happen all the time but you know you've heard obviously that there are different ways of keeping dogs and and in kennel situations or, or daycare so um, you would have the ability to do that would have the to, to, to limit it to the particular applicant oh. so that if, if they left moved on to mm -hmm. a different bigger place mm -hmm. Um, the permit would stay with the property if you permitted it that way. No. I have another kind of I don't know technical question. What the traffic mitigation design isn't that part of the site plan approval? It's in you eleven point six. It is part of site plan, and when you file for a special permit, the site plan is also part of that. So you need to meet the criteria in the site plan approval. So they don't need to submit a site plan, but they need to satisfy the requirements. Well, in lieu of um, that's the other thing you could per, you could grant waivers to a full engineered site plan because no no um, you know there's no new construction on the site except for the fencing in the back now. It's, you see, so typically someone could submit, um, you know, a plot plan that was that was as shown. Versus if it's new construction, you definitely need to see survey plans, topo changes, and things like that. They weren't initially planning any changes to the site. It was everything was going to be internal to the building, except for the exterior fence. So should they have asked for a waiver of the site plan requirements? Um, technically, we ask applicants to. Please identify all the waivers that they're asking for, but you, it's not required ahead of time. You can certainly identify all the waivers in the site plan that are necessary. But that's how the traffic mitigation comes in through right. the site plan Correct. requirements. Correct. Uh, Carolyn referenced Kennedy Road. I don't know how many you were with us when we did that. We, I think in, in recent, I mean, in the last maybe three or four years, Carolyn, we had a um, dog kennel, dog daycare on Kennedy Road, which was very similar in nature to this applicant. And we had a dog grooming, I think, on North Maple, which was more recent, um, which was by appointment only. You make an appointment, bring your dog, it's groomed, and just and you leave. It wasn't a uh, daycare or, or um, your dog didn't stay overnight. But similar issues in that in, in, in both presentations, I think the board felt great idea, good application, well thought out, well structured, wrong location. Ultimately, it's the wrong location. And this feels to me uh, similar to that in that regard. I think. On a special permit, some of the criteria that need to be met that we should be aware of is, uh, will the use not unduly impair the integrity or character of the district? Will the use be in harmony with the general purpose and intent of the ordinance? I think you could argue that it, it wouldn't be, just because of its proximity. I, I, I love everything about this. I, love, I like the idea. I like the layout. I like the plan. I like, I like everything about it, except where it is. And I think where it is stepping back special permit thinking, you know, is this the best, is this the right use of this parcel in this area? Um, and I don't think it is because of that reason. Okay. Anybody else? 
I uh, tend to agree with you. The house on the right is very close, um, and it will have an impact on that property value, I feel, mm -hmm. um, in terms of, and, and the noise. Um, in terms of the noise across the street, in the manner, that wouldn't concern me so much because it's such a high traffic area, it's a pretty noisy area. Um, but the fact that there's someone 40 feet away there, and uh, change, potentially change that person's life, and mm -hmm. I agree with it. Would it be possible to approve it if, with requirements for landscaping and requirements that the shuttle be? used regularly? We can uh, impose criteria on the acceptance of the special permit. Yeah, but people use the shuttle. Right? Yeah, that's... I think the landscaping would work. I think the, sh the shuttle is not measurable enough. I think I you potentially... People you would sign up. Right. Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, but but it, it would be something that if you were to approve and you, know, you did phase in traffic mitigation, that um, and say year two comes around and they come back and they say, look how many people are on the shuttle services or a way we can, is that enough of a mitigation to offset the total amount of payment in lieu of actually making physical improvements? Um, you could certainly entertain that conversation once you've seen something that's actually in place and have data to back that up. Mm -hmm. um, but I think at the front end, you couldn't do that. It would be hard to do that. Uh, public uh, comment is still open. Is everybody? I'll move to close the public comment. Second, all in favor? Okay, so that means the public comment portion of the evening is over. So now there's uh, just an internal discussion with the board. Um, any questions? I thought I knew the property, but just to make sure, I mean, I knew where it was, obviously, but I wanted to go look at it, and I drove around it right before coming mm -hmm. And it, it is tight. Mm -hmm. Even getting that many cars in that parking lot, and being turned around, it's going to be mm -hmm. um, I'm not sure that the van's been well bought out, how to turn that around. Um, but it's not really the parking, that, or the traffic that worries me. I think that will get dealt with. And Route 9 is so busy that we'll absorb the traffic without much notice. But I think the neighborhood is a residential neighborhood. Mm -hmm. And so I, I, I'm swayed by the neighbors saying it's it's an unknown, but it's also, um, we do know dogs. And I, I think, we, I, I'd love to think my dog was going to behave the way I wanted to, but um, right. I just find that hard to guarantee. I mean, I think no pun intended, but Rachel's hearing's lost for a reason. She's working with part of the dog. But at the wrong places because they didn't know. <laughs> so, I mean, I, it, it's a heartfelt story. I, I want this business to succeed. It's a, it's a great business right. idea, but I'm, I'm swayed by the neighborhood. I, I drove up there yesterday, and I, when I left, I was more concerned about the traffic than I am right now after hearing the plan and looking at it. I still don't know if I, I buy it 100%, but it's been thought out. And I agree with you with the, the Route 9 traffic um, that it would, it would be absorbed to a certain extent. And they're trying to trying to limit it with, with the shuttle and the service, and I get all that. But uh, I keep going back to, to the precedent we've set on, on North Maple and Kennedy. But the Kennedy Road one was very similar. It was more rural. It was a smaller operation. And yet it still was the same argument, the argument that ultimately it was just too close to the neighboring uh, homes, and it was a rural residential area. And this isn't a rural residential operation. And so if you could take this. Amount of property. Right. right. Well, and I guess that's the other thing is I, I haven't, we haven't explored it in detail what happens to the conservation land. But I mean, I don't really think that this business can, I mean, I'm somewhat concerned about encouraging the, the dogs into the conservation land. And mm -hmm. I, I would. I mean, I've, we've had enough experience with this around town that I think we've, we've seen that it can create some problems too. Yeah. The, the noise obviously is a bit everybody's concern. On the other hand, the next door neighbor herself said that in the summer she can't sit out on her porch because it's too noisy from all the traffic. So it's kind of hard to argue with both ways. I mean, it's 
such a because of its location, there's a huge amount of ambient noise, background noise. If Rachel accomplishes what she hopes to, um, even if she only half accomplishes it, the additional noise that might not, not be any noticeable, any more noticeable than the small amount of additional traffic under it. special permit for kennel dog daycare at 241 Angel Road, please map ID 6 44. All those in favor? I'll get a second. Oh, second, I'm sorry. Second hand. All those in favor? Opposed? So that's why on the right-hand side, the window covering is a little higher. 
what they've done in the past is they normally would put a red, um, you know, just red with CDS on the windows. But in towns like yours, what they have is what they call a historic um, window print. And it's just, it's not your historic pictures, but it's just pictures of other historic buildings, of which I cannot name any of them. So, <laughs> but um, that's what they'd like to put up um, on the windows. We did get approved earlier from the Zone Board of Appeals. It was questionable whether um, you know the, the, the actual covering is a sign or it was just the CVS. But needless to say, we did get approved by them earlier. So they're just trying to make it look a little more appealing um, to the public. The CVSs can't be seen from the roadway. They're not illuminated. They're just there to cover up what was, was currently white. Carolyn, what's the history in this uh, as far as how it was covering up the white, how it was white to begin with when it initially was It wasn't the white, there was a portion. So originally when um, CBS came <coughs> out of the planning board, uh, it was under Highway Business District guidelines um, prior to the current ones, but there was still a um, requirement um, that there will be a, per a certain percentage of the building be glass. And so they presented the um, plans, elevations to the board for approval, which were this was the set that I emailed out earlier today. And so some of the window, uh, portion of the window, I think was frosted glass, and the other was clear see-through glass. And um, so the the intention was to meet that criteria of the ordinance to have. You know, the view from as from a pedestrian or perspective from King Street as a storefront. Um, but the board doesn't really dictate what happens inside the store, and so I think from pretty early on there was at least some you know um, display shelving on the inside of the store that was backed. It's backed up, so backed, that you're right, just right. getting the back. Right. Um, so it's sort of been that way for a number of years. Um, the permit was granted in 2002, 2003, something like that, and then constructed them. So um, the intention was to have a storefront window, or, you know, it's <coughs> either seeing into the store or having some kind of display right. window. So what we're talking about is basically just a nicer display. <laughs> right. Or what's being proposed. Can I clarify there, but this is not advertising. I mean, that's the conversation that went on at 5 o'clock. They're not, they're right, not putting not text, about, they're not putting words. Yeah, they are stuff. putting words, but your jurisdiction is not about the words. It's about um, creating more of a opacity to, you know, closing up more of that, that window than it already you can't through. see through. Right. I mean, there's there's still portions of the window that you can see through, but if they're up high, right. you can't really see that much that high. So this is does it provide a different, you know, better visual context than just a white blank space? Well, I mean, one problem is that, that the transaction area is there, I and mean, whether it's cigarettes displayed there or something, I mean, the, yeah, I don't know if you know about CVS, but CVS does not have back rooms any longer. Like back in the day, I used to do material handling, and they, everything would, you know, they would have a back room and they would store stuff. Now everything comes in in a tub. So at night, they restock the shelf. So whatever is on the shelf is all they have in the store to sell it. They then have going to go in the back room and go, oh, I'll get you another thing, too, you know, toothpaste. So they utilize every square inch of that space. And it seems to be working for them. Because <laughs> I know I spend 40 bucks every time I uh, questions by the board? Seems like a pretty straightforward one. It does. I mean, we've, we've talked all up and down the King Street. That there, I mean, in some sense, you do want the buildings to be inviting, and, and I think that's where this came from, is to try not to wall off a business inside a box. But um, it's already done. So. Okay. Right. It's right. just right. 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 done. I mean. Right. There's no public comment because everybody. So, if there are any questions, motion or opposed public hearing.
coming, I guess. You know, it's I think we got one. Sure. I move to close the public hearing. Second. Second, John. All in favor? Thank you. Uh, motion? I move to approve site plan amendment for CBS to site glazing CBS 6, 366 King Street, map ID 18D-47. Second, John. All in favor? Thank you. See, short <laughs> That's what I'm going to wait all night. I know, and I apologize for getting up, but I can only sit so long, and I'm now going to sit for another hour. Too much driving. Do we have any appointments? But I'll be keeping doing that. See, I said, don't feel bad for me. <laughs> I work with you, Steph. Thank you. 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 We do have other business. Uh, I put this one stuff on the back side, but it's terrible. That's the point of having all that back and then using it as storage space. Yeah. Karen, we still have we still have unfinished business. Yeah. Um, how much of that unfinished business? Well, <laughs> <laughs> let me throw it out there and just see what you think. So the next one item was. You guys talked about this, I don't know, several months ago, the, the hanging, um, projecting signs yep. over yeah. like Main Street, it's really yeah. pedestrian, it's the blade sign. Right. Um, oh, and street acceptance too. We definitely need to do street acceptance, so mm -hmm. if you want to pick oh, one and not the other one. But the blade signs were, I mean, really the only issue you guys had was, you didn't, you weren't sure, I think, if I remember correctly, you weren't convinced that the size was not going to be so overwhelming and create lots of visual clutter. So that's right. why we gave you example. Mm -hmm. Now, if you, we can certainly put that off for another discussion and pull it off of that public hearing agenda for April 14th if you want to spend more time on it. That's fine. There's no real rush to it. I just thought, all right, we're having a joint public hearing. Let's just... Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, because we've home. talked about it before. Right. We've talked about it. It's just that we just, you know, we, we, you guys didn't like the the big size sign um, that was initially proposed. So we scaled it back in that last conversation, but you still wanted to see examples of what, what might that look like. Well, you set out the examples. Yeah. So, you know, if you want to go over it or if you're fine with it, we can go ahead and, and then we can have a fuller discussion in the public hearing if you're not. So I can go ahead and put it forward if you want, if you're comfortable with it. Yeah, this is just a move it forward so we can talk about it again. But yeah. we've reduced the, the initial square footage that you threw out. Yeah. We were uncomfortable with. That's been addressed. Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, okay. I think I read in there that you can only put one of these on per building. Is that, right? Is that in there? Right. Mm -hmm. I, unless you get a special permit. So you, there's always a special permit avenue. The point of this is that... But what if you have a really big building? I mean, well, why, why can't you get... X per feet or something. I so, guess that was my only thought because if, other than if, other than one building, I think there's some footage requirement. Right? So this is in addition to wall signs that you're allowed. So we allow front wall signs on the face of a building, but any additional signage. So if you wanted a sign hanging over the sidewalk in addition to the the facade um, sign, that would trigger a special permit. So what this language would do is eliminate the special permit for adding a blade sign or a um, projecting, you know, sidewalk or wall sign, so that you could have two without coming to the zoning board first. And then that wall sign has we have different thresholds depending on your facade of your um, establishment. So your 10% of the facade or 100 square feet, whichever threshold you get to first. Um, this. Um, we only had one foot projections allowed for um, blade signs before, uh, at this point, that's all we have. And if you have a wall sign, you would need a special permit just for that one, one foot projecting wall sign. So this um, relaxes the zoning to the extent that it, it allows you by right to have both signs, a facade and a projecting sign, and it also expands the size of the allowed projecting sign. So I think um, there hasn't, it doesn't seem that there's always been, that there's been an issue about having a really big projecting sign, but that's still, you're, if you feel like you need something bigger, um, you can still go to the zoning board for a special permit. And in, in central business, if you have a big building, but three establishments, each establishment 
establishment yeah. gets in place. That's right. 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 Yeah. Only if it's on the first floor. Right. Well, you, you could get on walls. You don't. The point of a projecting sign is really pedestrian oriented. So if you're on the second floor, it, it, you know the point. It, the projecting wall sign. You want pedestrians to come up the stairs and buy what you're selling. Right, but you would have a door um, on Main Street, and you could have a sign on your door as well. Not a blade sign. Um, it says only businesses on the first floor right. may have a blade sign. Right. Unless you were to file for a special permit. So you need uh, a I recommendation? Did. Yeah, to move it I'd, forward. I'd like Same to say thing. go to public mm -hmm. comment. Mm -hmm. I would too. Mm -hmm. So is that a motion? I would, <laughs> I would, I would <laughs> take the blade signs uh, as revised and present them for public comment. Introduce them to council. Mm -hmm. Introduce them to council. Mm -hmm. Lead me through that one. Okay. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Does this go forward as a recommendation from the planning board? It's a sponsor by the planning board. Sponsored by the right. Which implies but a recommendation. Yeah, right. <laughs> right, but it doesn't it doesn't imply one way or the other way you the way you would vote on it because you would be taking public comment. So if there's something in the public comment that you know, changes. changes your perspective, you have it doesn't mean that you can't vote a different way once it comes to the floor. Oh, can I just ask another question? Oh. But you know, there's all these bullets and all these things, you know, and so if later on uh, we wanted to remove one of the requirements, does that require a vote of everyone, or that from this point going forward? In other words, well, I mean, it, if this goes forward to to public hearing, and through the public hearing, it makes sense to eliminate one of those bullets or modify it in some way. It, that can happen as it goes through the process. Again, um, depending on the type of change, if it's um, more stringent than what was advertised, it sort of depends. This one's be kind of different, but it may trigger going back for public hearing. It may not. So you could definitely make modifications through the process um, before it gets, even when council has it on the floor. And their final vote, they can make changes to it. So typically, when something like this is presented to us, we don't have to be unanimous in how we feel about it. That the wording is 100 percent right. Usually, initially, we'll, we'll we'll get feedback. Some things just right off the bat don't make sense to us, or we have we're confused. We need more input to to better understand what's being presented. We go back and forth, back and forth, and then it gets to a point where at least we're comfortable with it moving forward and initiating the discussion and and knowing that it's going to come back to us again uh, in a more formal and, and final uh, instance where we can act on it. So right now we're not so much acting on it as letting it go by. Right? So. so was so, there a second? No, there wasn't a motion second from John. All in favor? Okay. Now I have street acceptance. Moser, Olander, Ford, and Village Hill. So um, those street acceptance petitions, um, the reason why there's so many of them is that there are little bits. If you remember the Ford Crossing, which is the northern um, road at Village Hill now, also connects all the other pieces together so as the east-west um, road. So it connects Moser on one end. Olander on the other end, Village Hill in the middle, <laughs> but they technically came through as um, four separate petitions. Um, this is because they're building out in that direction at this point, and they've gotten to that. Right, and they, but they built the road that you all approved the subdivision. They had all these little stubs mm -hmm. to connect to all the other streets that had already been built. Mm -hmm. So what this means is that they've finished construction, they've, it's been inspected, DPW has looked at it, they've submitted them the the plans for street acceptance and the surveys and the title work. And only city council can, a, can approve um, or accept a street to be a public street. So this request is for city council to accept these little bits, including the long board crossing for street acceptance or as a public street. And um, <coughs> it went to city council, was referred out to both Board of Public Works and Planning Board for comment and recommendation. 
So what you would be doing is making a recommendation back to city council as to whether or not the city should take these streets and street stubs as public streets. Um, we're, from a staff level, we're all satisfied with the, the, um, the engineering reports and the construction reports showing that they built it in accordance with the plan. Did DPW have any comments at all? No, we, we ironed out everything. They're satisfied. It hasn't gone to the board yet, but um, I believe DPW recommendation will be to their board mm -hmm. to recommend acceptance. And so you guys will make your separate vote, vote. Board of Public Works will make their vote. Then City Council will ultimately, it will come back to City Council. They'll consider what both boards um, recommended and then make a determination. But all along the streets of Village Hill, it's always, there's always been the intention that they become public streets. This is just connecting the top end what's already operating at the bottom. Right. 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 So the other pieces have already been accepted. Right. It's already there. Yeah. Right. right. I'm on a roll tonight. You want one? Keep it going. Keep it going. <laughs> Keep it going. <laughs> I move we uh, uh, recommend to City Council that they accept Mosier, Orlander, Ford, and the Village Hill Road. Second time. All in favor? Just for consistency. What happens with the person that brings the agenda? I know. I, know really, yeah. <laughs> I think that's it. Well, so we've got some. Oh, do we have some minutes or no? No minutes. No. We didn't send that in. We didn't have a meeting. We didn't have a meeting. Oh, right. Oh, yeah. So I guess we're out. It's the meeting adjourned.